this kind of tie may be new to some of you. It's, it's, it's what young people wear. <laughs> At least uh, a young person told me that once. Um, I ministered so deeply to everyone last night by not speaking <laughs> that I'm almost uh, hesitant to go ahead, but <laughs> with some encouragement. I had several people come up and say how blessed they were that I did not speak. <laughs> <laughs> Let's read together from the word. In 1 Kings 19, we have a story that we all know, I'm sure. The calling of Elijah by the prophet Elisha. In 1 Kings 19, from verse 19... This is just after the time that uh, Elijah has been having his discussion with the Lord. And the Lord tells him that there are actually 7,000 in Israel that have not bowed the knee. And he said, said, go and anoint Elisha. So he departed from there, verse 19, and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat. 1 Kings 19.19. 19. While he was plowing with twelve pairs of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. And the end of the chapter tells us, after his sacrifice, he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. Then over in 2 Kings 2, we read of the end of the ministry of the, the older prophet, in Elijah, and reading here from, um, it was time for the Lord to take Elijah from the beginning of the chapter of 2 Kings 2. Elijah told his servant, Elisha, stay here please, for the Lord is sending me. And this is where Elisha says, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. The sons of the prophet are inter intervening there, prophesying, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from you today? The experience is repeated. And then in verse 6, Elijah says to the young prophet, stay here for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And Elisha says again, as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will not leave you. Then the old prophet took his mantle and folded it together and struck the waters, verse 8. And the Jordan was divided, and they went back across the Jordan from west to east on dry ground. And then the older prophet said to the younger, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. The prophet responds, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. You know the rest of the story? As they were talking, the chariot of fire came down from heaven and took the older prophet up by a whirlwind. Elisha saw it, and he took the cloak that fell. He took the mantle that fell. He turned and stood by the bank of the Jordan and crossed back over Jordan to the other side. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that your work, your word, your acts, and a bit more of your heart would be real, revealed to us tonight. Pray for a greater revelation of you, for me, for all of us. Thank you for opening your word to us. Amen. I read this passage many times, but I realized for the first time yesterday what Elisha and Elijah had done. Elijah asked the young prophet, what do you want? 
What do you want at this moment? The moment for which you have been preparing yourself. After the years of service, the following the older prophet around, the pouring water on his hands, as scripture tells us, he's saying, now, what do you want? And he brought him not only to the time, but to the place. Because I believe that God has chosen to work in time and in place. And one place that he has always used is east of Jordan. And that's what I saw for the first time yesterday. The young prophet had to go back over east of Jordan and stand on that bank, on that place of decision, where the children of Israel stood with Joshua the years before. And I think that is a place, figuratively, as we have been shown by the Lord, that we are standing now. The east of Jordan is always the place of decision. Standing there on that river, looking into the promised land, and making that decision. What do we want? And I think it can be summed up as the following one from what we know of Joshua and what we see here as well. Which inheritance will we choose? Elisha, at the end of his service, was at the end of his commitment. He could have gone back home. The commentators tell us that if he had 12 pairs of oxen with his plow, he came from a well-to-do family. Now he sacrificed one pair, but that left 10 anyway. He came from a well-to-do family. He could have said, well, that's enough. I'm going back home. Or he could have become a school leader. There was a school of the prophets there. As a matter of fact, there were two. They were all there, 50 of them. Young men, on fire, prophesying, full of good ideas. Elisha could have said, I'll take this, I'll take that. He didn't have to have asked for that double anointing of Elijah. Let's think about that anointing of Elijah. That was an anointing for trouble, for problems, for persecution, and for hard times. And that's what he asked double of, because it went along with the anointing. But as he stood there on the east bank of the Jordan, that's what, exactly what he asked for, a double portion. And he received it. He went on to do twice what his master had done. I'd like to tell you a story from the mission field. There was a mission team who went out to an underprivileged people group. They had heard the gospel but had not really caught on to it. It had not made an effect in their lives. So these people went with the motto, pray and work. They had a ministry of intercession of teaching the word to this people which had been Christianized but not really converted. And they also came in with a development, community development ministry. They saw that one of the main problems that the people were facing, they couldn't spend much time in learning how to read or go to church or whatever, was the terrible economic situation they were in. So they brought them a new crop. They helped them clear land for it, land which had been terrible, dense forest with, uh, with boulders and everything that had to be chipped out of the way little by little. And as they slowly brought in the new crop and taught the people and as they prayed, the very economy of the place started to change. And the people started to change. And it ushered in what was to become a time of revival that changed the course of the history of that people. And I'm talking, of course, about the people of this canton of Vaux in about uh, a thousand years ago in the 11th century when a group of Italian monks came up over the pass along this road along this lake on the North Shore which some call the oldest road in Europe. And they came and they planted grapevines on this North Shore of the lake. They saw the sunshine and the rain and they thought these people can live better lives than this. There was an anointing, a mantle of anointing on those early teams of monks each monastery movement was a revival movement, of course. And as, each, as one would die back, another one would take off. And many of them sent missionaries in one of the pagan 
hard, poor places that was reached through these teams was Switzerland. Of course, <clears throat> what we were facing was the one who tries to steal and kill and destroy. And it, after this time of revival, and some would link it to the construction of the great cathedrals in Lausanne and Geneva and elsewhere, buildings built around the idea of worship. The revival was stolen away. The fire was taken away. The people were confused. The leaders were sidetracked. There was another form then that the Lord used. I believe that this mantle was passed on. The mantle that had been on the early monastic communities. The mantle that we could sum up, I believe, as including evangelism, training, and mercy ministries. It's one of these little coincidences that we run into in the study of history. That's what they came to do, to evangelize, to teach, and to help the people economically. The new structure that God brought about just about exactly a thousand years ago began in Italy and in Paris, and it was a new idea. It had some roots, perhaps, uh, in the Greek schools. There are different discussions about this, but this new structure was called a university. And as some of the revival fire of the monastic movements died back, the university came into being. It was an incredibly powerful structure. It was founded around an ideal of community living where students and teachers lived together. They didn't, they didn't just study, they lived together. They had their meals together. Their residences were in the same quadrangle often. They studied the word of God together. The character, personal lives of the students were under examination as well as their minds and their academic growth. And these institutions were set up originally for the purpose of training leaders for the church. And not only for the church but for all of society, because at that time there was no separation between the church and the rest of society. These were the, the these, these universities, these structures were training the cream, the essence of the leadership of the society. And there was incredible intellectual ferment in these universities. The very idea of academic freedom came to birth in the, the Christian universities of the time. There was no idea of academic freedom, which is now an idol in our day and prevents academic freedom everywhere. But there was no idea of it until Christians came up with it. But of course, their idea of academic freedom was freedom under God to do what is right. And the idea of academic freedom has moved a long way from that original ideal. After this revival died back and had been stolen away, turned aside, confused, there was another revival of this structure. I believe in another way of saying it is the mantle was passed on to a new generation. And the revival at that time we can call the Reformation. And I'd like to share a bit about that with you. Um, and I'd like to use examples from this area, as this is where the Lord has put us for this conference. We don't often realize that the Reformation began in this country with a fiery street evangelist, a red-headed guy who would literally go break down idols, a crazy Frenchman whose specialty was starting riots and getting out of town before he was executed. <laughs> His name was William Farrell, and without William Farrell, there would have been no Reformation in Switzerland. He provided the fire, the ministry of the evangelist, and he was in a the, the apostolic evangelist. Now he knew very well that he was no pastor or builder. So his strategy was to place pastors in the cities that he had stirred up and caused riots in. And once people were ready to get saved, he would put in a builder and a pastor. The man he put in Lausanne was named Viré. The man he put in Geneva was called Calvin. Calvin was the builder. He provided the fireplace, but Farrell provided the fire. And you need both if you're going to keep warm. Calvin had no plans to stay in this backward city of Geneva. He wanted to continue on with his studies in some place more civilized, like Basel or Holland or something. But Farrell heard one night that he was coming through. They had been classmates at the University of Paris. And Farrell went to his lodgings and, and invited him to stay 
and join his team there in Geneva and build up the work. And Calvin explained that no, he couldn't stay and do this work uh, with Farrell because he was going to go on and continue his studies. And then Calvin wrote later that he remembered to his dying day what Farrell said to him. Farrell stood up with his burning eyes and his red hair and he said, May God curse you and your studies if you leave the work which he has called you to do here in Geneva. <laughs> Calvin had a change of guidance. <laughs> it was actually more of an example of directive leadership. <laughs> we don't do things like that anymore. Farrell had not had that particular course, so he went ahead and did it. <laughs> anyway, what happened is that Calvin began to build. And there were some incredible things that happened as he took on the mantle and began to build things and to go farther than the old prophet had done. He took the old structure farther than it had gone before. He did twice the miracles in one sense. John Calvin had the idea, the first idea in the history of the human race that's known of, that all the children in a city should have education. So he built a school, a Christian school. Actually, he challenged the parents. They paid for it and put it up in less than a year. And they built so strong that that building is still being used as a school by the city of Geneva, 450 years later. That was the, the idea of universal education for children came out of that revival that we call the Reformation. Very soon, they realized they had a problem. It's not a new problem. And that was that through, through Farrell's ministry of going into the big cities and causing riots, the people had gotten stirred up and many had accepted the uh, Reformation in the bigger cities. It had happened in Lausanne, in Geneva, Egla, some of the other bigger cities. But in the small towns and in the villages, <coughs> there, was, there, was no, uh, there was no revival yet. It wasn't that the people were closed. They were asking for preachers and pastors, but there was no one to send. The harvest was white, but the laborers were few. So they decided, because they, were, they had these situations where people were coming for help, asking for workers, we will listen. We will convert. They decided to start a university. And the motivation behind their university was to train missionary pastors who would preach the word, who would go out into those villages, who would do what some would call planting churches <coughs> all throughout this part of Switzerland. They didn't have a building, so they used a corner of the cathedral. They started teaching the ones they had. Within a few short years, they had 700 students. It was one quarter of the city of Lausanne was estimated to be university students who came from all over the, the Europe to sit at the feet of Calvin's disciples and learn. There were some incredible things that happened. Let me share just one example. <clears throat> they weren't just interested in... Um, how shall I say it, just study or that kind of thing. They were interested in impacting the people of the street. So one of the professors named De Bez in French wrote a street theater piece for his students to perform down at the Place de Palu. And those of you who go on the tour will see some of these places where these things happened. <clears throat> his theater piece was called Abraham Sacrificing. And they did it on the streets of Lausanne. The students and the professors coming out of their university, street ministry out of this university to help the people understand salvation and the plan of God and the word of God. Well, what happened though, the reason this play is remembered today, very few in the church remember it, but anyone who studies French, the history of the French theater has to study this play because it was the first tragedy written in the French language. It was written in a Christian university for street evangelism. And it defined tragedy in the French language. This man influenced the minds, the literature of his day. But his basic motive, his basic thrust was evangelism, bringing the word. After, <coughs> excuse me, a few short years, there were problems. 
<clears throat> theological disputes <clears throat> over double predestination and also over who had the right to communion. The government thought they should decide. Calvin and Farrell thought they should decide. Calvin and Farrell actually at one point over this dispute stood up in the church on Easter Sunday morning in Geneva and excommunicated the entire congregations of the two main parishes of Geneva and then walked out. <clears throat> this was a teaching method. <laughs> they were trying to communicate that they disagreed with some of the practices. Calvin was later asked to return back to Geneva. Farrell was not. But Calvin did go back and continue on there. Anyway, the fire died down in this structure as well. It had been, things, the revival was turned aside. The mission's thrust of that original Christian university had once more been lost, and it bogged down. There was a study of Greek philosophy instead of the Bible. And some of the things for which the reformers died were forgotten in Calvin's university even a century later. In the 18th century, as a matter of fact, a Greek portico was uh, mortared on to the end of the Cathedral of Geneva. The Greek architecture was added on to the Gothic as Greek thought replaced the word of God in the seminary. And architecture as well is an expression of our theology. Many non-Christians are convinced of this. Well, about the same time, the church in France started to go through intense persecution. The king revoked the edict which had given religious freedom to the church in France. And uh, it was entire Protestant cities such as Orange were forced to either um, renounce their Protestantism and reconvert to Catholicism or to leave the country. And by the tens of thousands, many French Protestants left. Some of the ones who stayed and abjured their faith were under deep remorse for several years and then left afterward. This mass movement of people having to leave their country for their faith gave us a new word in French and in English, the word refugié, refugee, was used for the first time concerning the Huguenots of France. It was the first use of that word, but not the last. Geneva at that time became a city of refuge, and the, the um, city fathers vied with themselves to see who could welcome the, the refugees the most. They had no land. But what do they do in their small country with not enough land to welcome the refugees? They built extra stories on top of their houses. You can see one of the old squares of Geneva with the top stories are architecturally different from the bottom stories. That's how they did it in order to welcome refugees. And that's also the foundation of the prosperity of Geneva, first with the Reformation and then with their acceptance of the refugees. Geneva was once known as the smelliest city in Europe. And that's changed, but because of the gospel. At that time in France, the pastors had to leave on pain of death or exile in the galleys of the king where they had to row as slaves in his ships. But many stayed in order to minister to the church, and it was the church of the desert. And in that church of the desert, people had to go out into the caves and the hills and the forests in order to hear the word of God and to receive communion. And that's what they did. And these pastors would minister from forest to forest, one step ahead of the armies of the king, in order to minister to the church. After a few years, though, it was evident that there, were no, there was no younger generation coming on. How could you train pastors in that situation? So there was a man called Antoine Cour, pronounced court in English. He had the idea to begin a training structure, a kind of university, pastoral training school, to go back into France as uh, missionaries, to minister to the church there. And he had the idea of doing it in Lausanne, in the shadow of the cathedral, right between the cathedral and the university buildings. His uh, screening process was original. If a young man felt he had a call to be a pastor, he was to prepare three sermons and find an older pastor who would accept him as an apprentice for a year. He would travel with that older man, serve him, pour water over his hands, carry his preaching pulpit for him and his books, 
and be discipled under that older man. That older man would test his call. If at the end of that year, the older man thought he had a call, he would send him to Lausanne, through the Jura Mountains, and through the armies of the king. That was a test of his prayer life. <clears throat> if he made it, it was a confirmation that he had the call. <laughs> <clears throat> then he would come and study at a three-year program in the shadow of the Cathedral of Lausanne. And at the graduation ceremony, Antoine Cour, the director of the school, as he gave the diploma, said this, I give you a certificate of death. I send you back to the suffering church in France. And in that school, <clears throat> building which still stands, over 400 pastors were trained in the 18th century. And most of them gave their lives for the gospel in France. There's a mantle of missionary training that God is passing on. At the end of the 18th century, things were even worse in the Christian universities of Calvin at Lausanne and Geneva. You could study to be a pastor for three years and never read the word of God once, and except in your study of Hebrew, you had to read a few psalms. Otherwise, you read only Greek and Roman professors. Into that completely uh, liberalized, apostate, captive church, the Lord sent a young man, a Scotsman named Haldane, who did not speak French very well, but who had a novel strategy to reach the theology students of the University of Geneva. It's called Bible study. <clears throat> they had never had a Bible study. They had never read Romans. And as this young man in his bad French opened up Bible study to them, they got saved. First a few, then dozens, and then scores. And that began the movement of the Spirit that is still called today the revival. Because it didn't just happen in Geneva. It spread all the way down to Lausanne. It spread all across Switzerland. New denominations were started. The Reformed Church was renewed. Swiss farmers in the wintertime, when their, most of their work was over, would fill their backpacks with Bibles. And they took the word of God into every house and village in France. Courted the entire country. France in the 19th century knew the word of God much better than France in the 20th century. The revival spread across France. People by the hundreds were saved. Groups of 600 new converts would write back to Geneva and say, send us pastors. They had a problem, though. They didn't have any pastors to send. They didn't have a training structure to provide the workers. So they decided to start one. They started one in the shadow of the church where the revival had broken out. And the whole of the history of the Church of France was changed by this revival movement. But yeah, there in this training, training institute one day, a couple of the students had the idea to go down to an Italian battlefield and help out with the wounded. They went down, they were so moved at the suffering they saw. This was in the early 19th century. But they came back and gave a report in the church. And they decided not to become traditional pastors, but to start something that was brand new at the time an organization that would minister to those who were under the threat of war, dislocation, or whatever. They finally called it the Red Cross, born out of revival in the place where God had chosen to work. Just last year, I think it was, I read a little tiny article. The Red Cross has now changed its name and its symbol. Its symbol is no longer a cross. It's a cross in the shadow of a crescent moon. Its name is no longer the International Red Cross. It's the International Red Cross and Crescent. You may not have heard this. The publicity people for the Red Cross did not exactly play it up in most of the countries of the West. But that mantle has fallen to the ground. The mantle of Christian mercy ministries that was linked with that training school that was born out of revival has fallen in the dust as far as I know, has not yet been taken up. And this is the word that was coming to me as I came back to Europe from a time of study in the States two years ago without any plan at all to study history. I have never read a history book all the way through. I am not a researcher. These things just started being shown to me in little articles and remarks and conversations. 
And this word kept echoing in my spirit, the mantles are falling. The mantles are falling. In the 20th century, this training institute had, uh, had closed its doors. There was no missionary training institute in uh, this part of Switzerland, in this canton. And there was a medical doctor who came back from India because I believe of the illness of his wife called de Benoit. And this medical doctor had in his heart because he couldn't continue his medical missionary work in India to start a missionary training institute here in Switzerland to mobilize Swiss Christian young people to send them into the whole world. And he bought a bunch of unused farmland way up above Lausanne in a little suburb, a little village called Venn. And that's right here in 1926. He built the Missionary Training Institute. An English lady visited, challenged um, his wife, I believe it was, or his mother, not sure of all the details, to begin the, the, the branch in this part of the country of Scripture Union. And that was begun. Then later on, when the freeway went through, the Bible Institute moved down the lake. But as I was <clears throat> reading from Isaiah 64 that Paul gave us this morning, I had forgotten this passage in it. You may remember as you go around the corner out here that there is the foundation of a building and they're burning scrap wood in it. And that's the original place of this Bible Institute. And it just struck me, this verse that we read, Our holy and beautiful house, where our fathers praised thee, has been burned by fire, and all our precious things have become a ruin. The mantle is falling. In recent times, many good things have happened here at this place for missionary training. On this mountain, I believe, that God has chosen to use. One of them, of course, is the Lausanne Congress in 1974. The Tema. Congresses where thousands of European young people were gathered to get a vision for the world. And a couple of kids who were walking around a street up in Chalatagobe 20 years ago this week. The mantle, I believe, though, is falling. What is this mantle? I believe that it is a whole mantle. It is one cloak. And it wraps up in it preaching of the word, training, and mercy ministries. And I think it's good that we don't try to get out the scissors and cut up the mantles of God. <clears throat> Every time we see in the history of the church that this mantle has been kept whole and accepted and taken up, there have been twice the miracles done in the next generation. I believe that God had an idea an idea of a university, one structure where the leaders, the young leaders of the society would come together around the word of God in a worshiping community with being able to see the transparent lives of their teachers and leaders and professors. And they would live it out there together, but their purpose would not be to stay there. It would be to go into all the world, to influence the entire world, to take the gospel to those who hadn't heard it, and to change the society as well. The mantles are falling. If I may change images. <clears throat> There's an old European legend about a princess. And this princess was um, poor, dirty. She had lost her inheritance and apparently had even forgotten it mostly. No one recognized her as a princess. She had fallen so low. She was a daughter of a king, but didn't remember. She had an ugly stepmother and three ugly sisters. But finally it took supernatural intervention before she could meet her prince and reclaim her inheritance. This story, of course, is the story of Cinderella. But it's a powerful story, and it was told long before Walt Disney got a hold of it. And actually, God himself was the first one to tell it. In Ezekiel 16, we read the story of the princess 
The princess who was found by God in a field. The princess of uncertain beginnings. Ready to die. Lying there in blood and in filth. But the Lord passed by and he saw her. And he picked her up. He cleansed her. Rubbed her off. And he saw that she was raised right. <clears throat> and when the time of her maturity came, he clothed her in beautiful clothes. There's a detailed description in the chapter. The silk, the jewelry, the fantastic things that she was given. I think this is a picture, of course. It's a word to Jerusalem. I'm well aware of the context. I also believe that we can apply what is said about Jerusalem to the church as the Lord leads. But I'm taking it tonight to apply it to the Lord's burden, I believe, which was a Christian university. A university of perhaps uncertain beginnings, perhaps with some Greek beginnings. But whom God saw when it was tiny and dirty and took it and cleansed it and purified it and grew it up. And then when it was mature to the place where it was something that could be helpful in society, he released it and he clothed it. And what did the Christian university do? Time after time after time. Took the very gifts that God had given and gave them to the, to the idols, to the princes around. Took the very gifts of God to give them away and commit harlotry. The worst kind of idolatry. And I believe that's exactly where we stand with the university today. The mantle has fallen so low that we may have to dig it out. The impurity, the filth, the spiritual harlotry, philosophical idolatry that has gone on is just incredible. Even in the church, we have a great deal of trouble to be taught by God. We would rather that others teach us. Our Lord himself said, Let, he said, call no man teacher. One of, the, one of the principles of the reformers was, let there be no human institution between the believer and God. But what about in the worship of the mind? We have not only put, I believe, human institutions, but we have let the principality stay there, and we would rather be taught by others than taught by God himself. But throughout his prophets, as the Lord time and time again uses this incredible image through Isaiah, through Jeremiah, through Hosea, to try to describe to the people who have gotten so far away from him, they can't even imagine that he loves them in this way. He uses this image of intensely personal and intimate love, the image of the, the bridegroom for the bride. The bridegroom who has prepared a bride for the most wonderful marriage, and she goes away and commits harlotry, prostitution. What does the bridegroom feel like? What does God feel like when he looks down to the places where his name has been called, but now are desolate and are burned with fire? And the name of the Lord Jesus Christ can no longer be pronounced in some of these institutions. I believe that the heart of God is broken over many, many things in this world. <clears throat> Most of all, over human beings. Over the children, the widows, the poor, the ones who have never heard. But I believe it's also broken over some of the things that we have done with some of the riches that he has given. The university, I believe, was an idea given by God. It is such a powerful idea that now Islam and Marxism have taken it over. It's the one place in society where all the leaders of society come together and are trained. There is no other place that is that powerful. Where you can influence society in such a way, in such a short time. It is the place. It, that is the time when those young leaders are there. Charles Malik, the former ambassador from Lebanon to the UN, former president of the UN, said this, 
he said the university was the most influential institution in the world today. And then he said the business of the church is the university. If, we, if the church has backed off from the university, we are not doing our job. The university, as it decided in the age of so-called enlightenment, 200 years ago in France, a movement that spread very quickly across the world at that time because it suited people's desires so much, as they formally decided that God was no longer their teacher, that revelation would no longer be their authority, we came to the point where we were left with a study of philosophy without truth. You go to a philosophy department today in a university and tell them <coughs> excuse me, that you're there to find truth. <coughs> you might as well tell them that they're, you're there to look for the Holy Grail. They won't think that's any less mysterious. Doug Fever was telling me in discussions in his university with the chairman of the art department that the chairman had forbidden him to use the word beauty in relationship with art. He said that word has no meaning. Please do not use it in talking about art. So the modern university, as it has left God, has given us philosophy without truth, art without beauty, music without rhythm or melody, and by that I mean uh, classical music, Medicine without mercy. Law without justice. Economics without compassion. Government without service. Architecture without human beings. And in the final triumph, theology without God. And people ask, why do we need a Christian university? I believe that the heart of God is broken over whom we let teach. Jesus told us, go and teach the nations, disciple the nations. To do all that I have taught you to do. Who do we look to as our teachers? Even in YWAM, in my life, as I have looked as in a study of, of culture and tried to study out of my ministry, it's just hit me within the last few days to what point I have been taught, discipled by ideas that were not at all biblical. And I had to make a conscious decision to put it down, to break it off, that I was not going to accept those ideas any longer. And I was going to look at that from the Word of God and start over again. I believe that the heart of God is there. He is waiting. We are standing east of Jordan, where Joshua was, where the young prophet was. We have been prepared for this in no way, <clears throat> except a certain degree of service. And a certain practice of listening to God. But I believe that the question of the old prophet is the question of God to us. What do you want me to do for you? The mantle is there. We can pick up as much of it or as little of it as we want to. We can take the scissors and cut off whatever we like. We can pick up one corner of it. We can go lead a school of the prophets. But I believe that God has chosen to do something on this mountain, in history, in space and time. And he brought us here again 20 years after the fact. And he's asking us the same question. The mantle has been passed on in this very place, on these few square meters. And now the question is addressed to us. It's a question that we have to answer, of course, before the Lord, but also as a body. What do you want me to do for you? Amen. Amen.